She trumps them all. I just was going to tell everybody about that. Yes, we are pleased tonight to uh, have a program that's a little bit different for us, but it's history related. Uh, Michael Reinhardt is uh, the grandson of Bonnie and John Martland, and uh, he got interested in, in uh, vintage baseball and uh, joined a, a team called the Temecula Deer Brothers, which I'm sure he'll tell you about, and uh, has put together a presentation about the birth of uh, vintage baseball or the birth of baseball in Southern California. So, Michael Reinhardt. I just want to thank uh, the Temecula Valley Historical Society for allowing me to do this. Um, I know it's not directly related to Temecula history, but I promise I will tie it in with the Temecula Deer Brothers, um, the team that I'm part of. Um, so just going to start off with just a little introduction. All right, so uh, just kind of my background into how I got into baseball. I um, grandson of John and Bonnie, huge Red Sox family, so I grew up a Red Sox fan. Um, even though I was uh, born and raised here in Southern California, um, huge Red Sox fan, I really started getting into baseball when I started playing Little League um, here right up the street in Menifee. And it wasn't until I got my first pack of baseball cards that I really started um, diving into the history of the sport. That's what really sparked my, my um, passion into learning about the history of the sport. And from there, uh, David Ortiz was my biggest idol growing up. Red Sox legend. Um, and from there, I really started getting into the history of minor league baseball, um, collecting minor league cards. I lived right down the street from the Lake Elsinore Storm. Um, they're the minor league team for the San Diego Padres. They started down there in 1994. Um, I've been going ga to games since they started in 1994. Um, and naturally, um, as I progressed, wanting to learn the history of the team, it kind of spiraled out of control. Um, and I really got into research for the California League. So they have teams, they started in 1941. That's where the bulk of my research has been uh, for the last 10 years or so. So I started working with the league historian, um, kind of um, putting together a, a comprehensive history of that league, put together a website, working um, with the league closely to um, create the record book and keep um, records of all that. So. My next step, um, after diving into that, I found a group called SABER, uh, which stands for the Society of American Baseball Research, and this is where I really started getting involved in the history of the sport in general. Um, I joined a subcommittee, which was the 19th Century Baseball Committee, so basically just focusing on all aspects of the sport in the 1800s. So that kind of is what led me to uh, my presentation. Um, a little bit further, um, in addition to enjoying the history of the sport of baseball, I actually um, really enjoy playing baseball as well. So um, one day I saw on Facebook there was a call for uh, players needed in the Southern California Vintage Baseball League. Um, it was a pretty new league. They had one season in and they were looking to start a team here in Temecula. Um, went out to the tryouts with Mark here. Um, it was just me and him trying out. Um, there was only two of us, so we made the team. <laughs> And then after that, we slowly started gathering players. Um, our inaugural season was set to be in 2020, but the pandemic postponed that. So we actually had our first season last year in 2021. Um, I think we did pretty well. Um, I do have a couple other players here. Uh, we have Norm and Steve here as well. I thank you guys for joining us there in their uniforms. If you guys have questions too, they're pretty knowledgeable. Um, so our first season, we did pretty well. Um, we made it to the playoffs. We lost in the first round in a heartbreaker, but it was a lot of fun. It was a great learning experience. Um, here's kind of just a team picture and a few pictures um, of myself. Um, this league does use the 1886 rule book, so we play with the authentic um, rules, uniforms, equipment, um, which baseball did look a lot like it does today, but it also had a lot of differences. And I'll kind of jump into that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, so you guys can kind of see how baseball's evolved over the years. So I know this presentation is about how baseball started in California, but before we talk about that, we really have to jump back um, and kind of get a basic understanding of how baseball started in general. 
So baseball's origin story. So actually in the early 1900s, um, 1903 to be exact, this was a popular question. People were asking, how did baseball start? Um, There's a lot of different opinions and memories that um, kind of overlapped each other. So uh, Major League Baseball created a commission, uh, later called the Mills Commission, uh, which was a group of seven men that were had the responsibility of finding the actual history, the roots of how the sport started. So after about two years, they came to a conclusion. After two years of research, they found out that it was Abner Doubleday who invented baseball in Cooperstown in 1839. Uh, this was right before he became a Civil War hero as a Union Army general. And um, so because of this, they put the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, named the field there right after him, Doubleday Field, and they definitively proved that baseball was an American sport. It didn't evolve from Britain. Um, it was created here in America, and it was an American sport. So it was a perfect, perfect story, but there was one problem. That entire thing was a myth. <laughs> so it wasn't actually true. So um, now that we've done a little bit more research, we have um, a better understanding of how the sport actually did start. So it wasn't uh, uh, Abner Doubleday in 1839. In fact, he wasn't even in Cooperstown at the time. He was actually at West Point, and um, in his lifetime, he never claimed to be the inventor of baseball. He never actually had any real involvement with baseball. He died 14 years before the Mills Commission uh, made that claim that he was the father of baseball, so he never had a chance to confirm or deny it, but we do know now um, he wasn't involved in baseball at all, but still, the Hall of Fame remains in Cooperstown. The field is still there, named after him to this day. They actually named a minor league baseball team after him, too. Um, so his involvement in baseball was none, but his, his legend still lives on in the sport. And a lot of people today still think he is the inventor of baseball. Um, but we do know the real story now. So um, kind of backing up well back before the 1700s, um, there was dozens of different bat and ball games that were played across schoolyards um, in all different countries and naturally here in America when we um, were first here. So some of the games that that the that baseball kind of got its um, derived from include rounders, three old cats, school ball, round ball, wicket, cricket. There's actually a huge list, dozens of different bat and ball sports. Um, and baseball, as we know, derived from these sports. Um, it's important to know, I know on my cover slide, baseball was split into two words, so if there's any teachers out there, I did that intentionally. Um, in the 1800s, baseball was two separate words. It wasn't until the early 1900s that they started putting that together in one word. Um, but looking back, baseball was actually just a general term that was used for um, all different bat and ball games that involved running around bases. So baseball was really a collection of different games. Um, and these were mostly played by kids um, in a schoolyard, so it wasn't anything official, just kind of playground games. And it kind of evolved from there. So really, I don't want to get too much into the history because that could be a whole nother hours long presentation, so I'm going to keep it kind of short um, and simple. The game of baseball really, once it started evolving into um, the 1830s, 1840s, there was um, different variations, and that depended on the region that baseball was played in. So the most popular ones were the Philadelphia game, the New York game, and the Massachusetts game. And um, although they were all baseball, they all had different rules. There was um, different variations, and these were just three of the most popular. Um, throughout the country, there was dozens of different variations of baseball. Um, and it's important to note, um, town ball um, was retroactively used to um, describe a lot of these sports. Since baseball, um, as we know it today, they didn't want to confuse it. So looking back, they retroactively called anything that didn't specifically turn into baseball town ball. But at the time, they all referred to themselves as baseball players. Um, one of the earliest known teams was the Olympic Ball Club. They started in 1833, 
um, in Philadelphia. We do know they were not the first team. Um, there's references to other teams that were earlier, but this one, they had um, some history that survived that we know they had an official um, kind of rule book that they had. And maybe most importantly was the New York Knickerbockers. Um, they formed in 1845. Um, we know they weren't the first to play in New York. There were some earlier teams, such as the Gotham Baseball Club, uh, who played in 1837. But it was the New York Knickerbockers that uh, perhaps are the most influential as they put the rules um, officially on paper. Um, they organized. They were well organized. And they became the standard for baseball teams moving forward. Um, and they are obviously from New York, so they played the New York version of baseball. Um, so they were actually, it's, there's a little bit of controversy up if they were the first team to um, put the rules on paper or if they adopted them from another team, but they actually put those very first original 20 rules um, into a pamphlet. So they had it set in stone so there would be a uniform playing field across um, all the teams that played in New York. The game started um, evolving and exploding in the New York area specifically, so they wanted to have a uniformed approach to the game. So their early rules, a lot of them were actually very similar to, we see, uh, to what we see in baseball today, um, which include they established uh, the playing diamond in the bases. So they established the three bases and home plate. A lot of the different variations actually had a fifth base. Um, so they had four bases and home plate. It was more in a square, um, so it was kind of some subtle differences, but this established the diamond as we know it today. Um, the only difference is the dimensions were a little bit smaller. Um, today we have 90 foot bases. Um, this one, it's estimated to be roughly between 75 and 80 feet. The second rule that they put in writing was the uh, three strikes and you're out. So they standardized three strikes for an out. Um, and it's important to note, um, if you're not too familiar with baseball, if you drop the third strike um, today, it actually doesn't count as a strikeout. Uh, if you drop the third strike and you swing at it, the batter still has to run to first base. That rule seems odd to most baseball fans, casual fans. Um, but this actually started way back in 1845 with the New York Knickerbockers. So they actually put in there, um, the third strike can only count if the catcher catches it on that, on that swing and a miss. Um, they also implemented three outs in an inning. A lot of variations before would be the entire team bats, and then they switch sides. Um, they also established foul territory. So this was really um, a landmark decision that they had. Um, a lot of the variations at the time, there was no foul territory. If they hit the ball with the bat and it went anywhere, um, some skilled players could even hit the ball backwards after the pitch. Um, so they had to position players in a variety of areas around. So, um, so establishing uh, foul territory was huge. It was in between those first and third base lines um, to create the diamond that we know today. Um, they also put in there that batters and runners cannot advance on foul balls. And this was probably the most important rule. Um, prior to the, uh, the Knickerbockers putting out these rules, um, tagging runners before, um, they, called, they called it soaking, and it was basically throwing the ball at a player to get them out, kind of like, to, uh, like kickball is today. So um, they say, oh, and this was kind of debated whether this should be a rule or not. It was thought of as unmanly by taking that <laughs> rule out. Um, but, you know, the New York Knickerbockers, um, not wanting to get injured any longer, they put this in there and it became a rule that, that stuck. So um, it became the standard practice that you have to tag the runners instead of throwing the ball at them to get them out. Um, and they set the batting order. Before, it was anybody could bat at any time. Um, if they were available, they set the batting order uh, to make sure that you go in order. So those were some of the rules that were similar that we see them today. Um, and these next set of rules are going to be rules that they put in there that might seem foreign to anybody that has a casual knowledge of baseball. Um, and these evolved over the years. But first is today we see nine innings. Back then, um, it was the first team to score 20 run, 21 runs. Um, so this meant the game could go as few as you know three innings or it could go long into 12, 13 plus innings. 
Um, so this was the standard until until um, the early 1880s. Uh, it was 21 runs to win, or sorry, the 1860s. Um, secondly, pitching was completely different than it is today. Today, the objective of the pitcher is to throw the ball as fast as they can, as much movement as they can for curveballs, sliders, um, in order to fool the batter. Back then, this wasn't the case. Um, the primary goal or function of the pitcher was to just throw the ball up there so the ball could be put in play. So the ball actually had to be pitched underhand um, and in the general area so the batter could, could hit the ball. So with that being said, there was actually no strike zone, there was no balls, there was no walks. Um, the only way um, to get a batter out is them putting the ball in play or if they swung and missed three times. Um, the strikeouts were not common um, when the sport first evolved. The goal was mostly to put the ball in play to have, to have the game progress. And fielders did not use gloves in 1860 uh, or 1840s, 1850s. Um, they didn't use gloves. It wasn't until the 1880s that some players decided that it was time that they had a little bit of protection on their hands. Um, and these players were um, ridiculed for doing that as, again, it was thought of unmanly to have a glove. You're, you're supposed to play barehanded, that's the way you're supposed to do it. Um, so some players actually used um, um, skin colored gloves to try to hide it. Um, but eventually, um, it became the norm after they saw so many hand injuries, um, it became the norm that gloves were being used. And um, up through you know, the 1900s, the gloves looked a lot like this. Um, this is supposed to be a replication of an authentic um, glove from 1886. Um, and although it is better than a bare hand, it still hurts um, when you're catching a line drive at third base. <laughs> So, also another rule is the ball, to get an out, you can catch it on the fly or you could have caught it on one bounce, um, which is interesting to see. Um, this is something that was also another very controversial rule um, in later years. Again, the sport was all about um, being a manly sport, you know, you had to be tough to play, so they actually ended up eliminating that um, years down the line with a lot of controversy. But, um, interesting to note, you could catch it on one bounce and that was more or less to save hand injuries. Um, so this was the Knickerbocker rules um, as they established them in 1845. Um, but it wasn't until um, 1857 is when they created the National Association of Baseball Players. Um, and this is where the game really took a turn um, as um, to what we know today. So this was a group of 16 teams that were in New York and Brooklyn, uh, and they met to standardize the game. So they put um, specific rules, um, they met on a regular basis to create the Constitution and the bylaws um, and create more of a standard way of how teams play each other um, and how the schedule was laid out. So with this being started, uh, they used all the Knickerbocker rules and they made a couple adjustments. Um, but because they were so organized, they were ahead of all the other variations of baseball that the other variations, the Philadelphia game, the Massachusetts game, they did they did coexist simultaneously for a bit, but into the 1860s, all other variations of the game subsided and the New York, the New York game was the standard practice across the country. Um, that was perhaps the first time that New York has beat Boston in baseball, <laughs> unfortunately to say. <laughs> um, so, as I mentioned before, all other variations of baseball were retroactively called town ball. So historians today, they really utilize the Knickerbockers in 1845 as the starting point for baseball as we know it today. Even though it was referenced um, well before that, the game was played well before that, that's just kind of the starting point for historians um, for the game. So with that being said, now we're going to start the presentation with how did baseball start in California? So the game was really heavily centralized in New York at the time, um, and we did see that it expanded Philadelphia, a lot of other East Coast states and cities out there, um, but there was a major occurrence that brought people to California, and you guys could probably guess it, it was the gold rush in 1849. Um, so the population of California before the gold rush was 
14,000. That's quite a bit lower than Temecula is today. And within a year, um, it shot to over 100,000 with people getting gold fever, um, traveling by boat uh, to get here or across uh, the, con uh, the country. So I do want to note, um, it's, it's kind of hard to see here on the PowerPoint, but highlighted um, in this ad um, is the DeWitt Kittle Company, um, which I'll explain why that is important. Um, because this is a list of New York players that got gold fever. They actually left their homes, and in most cases they left their family to come to California in search of gold. So some of the some of the players that were prominent New York players that came over here um, that we know today, the DeWitt brothers, um, they played for the New York Knickerbockers. Um, one of the brothers was um, on the previous slide that I mentioned um, for that company. We also have Charles L. Case, Frank Turk, um, Alexander Cartwright, uh, William Wheaton, William Tucker, Edward Ebbets, and Walter T. Avery. Um, so these were all... Um, Everybody actually was on the New York Knickerbockers except for Charles Case. He played for the New York Baseball Club. Um, but they all came over um, and presumably spread the game of baseball in California. So we do have some early happenings in baseball. Um, so we're going to kind of start in 1851 is the first reported mention of baseball in in California newspapers. So this is the first known reference that the sport was played on this coast. And it was on February 4th, um, 1851. Um, it does say, a game of baseball was played upon the plaza yesterday afternoon by a number of sporting gentlemen about town. So this first newspaper article seems um, like the very first mention, just a casual game. Um, we, don't, we don't include this as the start of a first team. Um, we do assume this is kind of just like a pickup game for fun. Um, the newspaper does have mentions of baseball several more times in 1851. Um, it started getting more into a negative light. They, um, they were depicting the players as more of a rowdy crowd. Um, they had baseballs hitting horses um, around town in some of the newspaper articles. So it started getting kind of a negative reputation. Um, so we actually don't see a mention of baseball again, except for that 1851, early 1852 again, until, um, until 1858 we see mention again uh, in Sierra County, California, what was later named uh, Rabbit Creek. It was a popular uh, skiing des destination later, but it was also a big mining town. Gold was discovered there in 1850. So a lot of uh, people that didn't have success uh, when they first came to the state, they actually um, shifted over to Rabbit Creek um, in search of gold, and we do have a newspaper article um, that shows that baseball was being played there as well. So um, the excellent game is in much vogue at uh, LaPorte, Sierra County, California. So we do know um, the baseball was still growing, although it wasn't mentioned in newspaper articles. Um, the sport was growing, people were getting to know baseball, and uh, that brings us to our very first established teams. So. Um, that report was in 1858, so our very first teams we have coming to California uh, is in 1859. Now, the two largest cities in California at the time were Sacramento and uh, San Francisco. So naturally, um, those are where our teams first begin. Sacramento has claim to the very first baseball team in California. It was the Sacramento Baseball Club. Um, they established November 14th in 1859. And the newspaper reporters in San Francisco were um, a little upset that Sacramento had um, beaten San Francisco to the punch and got a team first. So after a couple of weeks of begging somebody to start a team in the newspapers, we finally got our first San Francisco team two weeks later. Um, it was the San Francisco Baseball Club. Um, they later renamed themselves the Eagle Baseball Club. Uh, later in the year, and they were established uh, November 28th, 1859. Um, and then we had one more team to come to come about in Sacramento. That was the Union Baseball Club in December 1st of 1859. Um, now we don't see any games in 1859. Um, we do see some inter-squad uh, competitions between the teams where they're just kind of playing themselves. 
Um, but it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be until the following year that we start seeing um, some more teams join as well as some of the first games in um, the history of California. So um, just to kind of point out, these are some of the teams. Um, as mentioned before, we had our two Sacramento teams. Uh, San Francisco, we have the original Eagle Baseball Club. They were joined by four more. Um, Stockton joined in with a couple teams in 1860. Um, Nevada City, which is actually in California, they had the Nevada Baseball Club uh, join. Princeton, Mariposa, Visalia, and then we even had a report of a team as far south as Los Angeles in the year 1860. So just wanted to pause here for a second. I did go over the rules um, that the Knickerbockers established in 1845, but by the time we get to 1860, um, the rules had changed a bit. And these rules came specifically from um, the National Association of Baseball Players that I mentioned. It was that group of um, New York and Brooklyn teams that first met. Um, that group had expanded to include any teams in the country that wanted to join and be part of that um, National Association. So some of the updated rules that we have by 1860, um, they had eliminated the 21-run rule to win a game. They replaced it with what we know today uh, with the nine innings. They also standardized the uh, distance between the bases to 90 feet, which is the same as it is today. Um, the pitcher's distance, distance was set at 45 feet, um, which is a bit shorter than it is today. Today it sits at 60 feet and 6 inches. Um, but at this time, they were still um, doing slower pitching. It was underhand pitching, so the distance didn't need to be too far back. Um, and a new rule that they had implemented in between that time was that runners couldn't advance on a ball that was caught um, on the fly. So they started in, um, adding an incentive for um, players catching the ball in the air as opposed to letting it bounce. Um, so although the batter would be out if you caught it on one bounce, uh, if there was any runners on base, they could run freely without waiting for it to be caught. So this is kind of the first um, insight that we see that they were um, getting rid of the, the one bounce rule. And finally, umpires could call strikes. Um, this was uh, kind of a big development that they had added. Um, what they were discovering is there was a bunch of players that were not swinging at good pitches, and there was really no penalty for that before this. Um, so although umpires could call strikes, this still didn't really establish a strike zone. Um, this was more of an umpire being able to get the game moving, keep the game progressing, and uh, penalizing players for just trying to delay the game on purpose, waiting for the perfect pitch. So this is the first uh, implement of a strike zone. All right, so for the purpose of um, this presentation, there was really two teams that um, stood out and became the prominent um, players, um, if you will, for the 1860 season. 1860 is where we see um, the first games. This is really the first season of baseball. So it was an exciting time. Um, I mentioned before we had the Sacramento Baseball Club and the Eagle Baseball Club, um, the founders for that very first team in California. Um, we have Charles Leonard and um, uh, William Lee. And for the Eagle Baseball Club, we have John Durkee and John Fisher. Um, and these two men, I'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation, but these were, um, by chance, they were probably the most influential um, individuals in keeping the game moving and establishing the game in California. So, because these were the first two teams in California, they already had a... Um, a rivalry before they even started playing. So this um, could be considered the first rivalry in baseball um, here in California. So now that we have our teams that were established, um, we have um, a little over a dozen teams throughout the state. Um, now it was time for the very first games. And it was Washington's birthday on February 22nd um, that we see the very first baseball game. Um, this is an, ex um, an exciting landmark um, a, a milestone, and it was the, the um, yes, it was his birthday. That's an authentic birthday hat. And it was the uh, 
San Francisco baseball club that put the first um, ad in the newspaper requesting somebody to play them. So they put the ad out there. The Sacramento baseball club, naturally, they took on the challenge. They said, we will play you for the first game. Uh, but it was actually the Red Rover team that had uh, that had responded to it a little bit quicker. So as much as we wanted to see a Sacramento versus Sac San Francisco um, first game, they honored the Red Rover team who were also in San Francisco, and they decided to take that on as the first game. So the very first game we see is the San Francisco Baseball Club against the Red Rover Baseball Club. And because Sacramento... Um, was second in responding to that. They started their own game. They played the other Sacramento team, the Union Baseball Club, and they decided to do it on the same day. So we have two games played on February 22nd, Washington's birthday, um, and it was the San Francisco game that started a bit earlier. So this actually takes um, precedent. It was it is regarded as the very first game in uh, the history of the state. So I know it's a little hard to see, but this is the box score from that very first game. Um, it's hard to read, but you can see the final score of the game was actually 33 to 33. Wow. <laughs> so as we know, there's really no ties in baseball. Uh, but the reason for this is after nine innings were played, the Red Rover baseball team refused to come back on the field. They were um, trying to claim that the San Francisco baseball pitcher was pitching unfairly. And the umpire at the time decided he was pitching fairly. There was um, no violation of the rules. And they still refused to come back onto the field. So the umpire was forced to give the win over to the San Francisco Baseball Club. So the final score of 33-33 to 33 stands as the first game. Victory was awarded to San Francisco. Um, and there was a lot of bad blood between the Eagle team and the Red Rover team. And we actually never see the Red Rover team again. This was their one and only game. They were that um, bitter over it that they just gave up the sport altogether. So the second game, which started at 1 p.m., just a couple hours later, down in Sacramento, was uh, Sacramento versus the Union Baseball Club. This was also another tightly contested game. This is an actual box score from that first game. Um, that was published the next day in the Sacramento Daily Union. Um, the final score on this game was 27 to 20. And, oh sorry, 20 to 14. Yeah, 20 to 14 was the final score. So it was a close game. Um, Sacramento Baseball Club came out on top, um, as they should have. They were the first team to establish. They were the lead baseball team at the time. So, and this game was held at Ferguson Field um, which was their home stadium. It wasn't really a stadium. It was their home field at the time. And I do want to go back real quick because I think I forgot to mention um, this game, the San Francisco game, was actually played um, at an area called Center's Bridge, uh, which is actually where the Seals Stadium was later built. This was the San Francisco Seals. Um, they played in the Pacific Coast League. If you guys are familiar with that, when they first started. And this is actually the stadium that the San Francisco Giants first played out for their first two years after they moved here from New York. So, interesting to note, the very first uh, baseball team in history, San Francisco Baseball Club, all the way back in 1860, played on the same location as the San Francisco Giants when they first moved, uh, which is a neat little piece of uh, history, playing on the same location. So next up was actually the California State Fair. This was the seventh annual fair. They had actually just established Sacramento as the location, the home location for the California State Fair. Before that, it had kind of moved from city to city. Um, finally established Sacramento as the location for that, and it's still held at that location today. So um, as baseball became a little bit more popular in California, the hype um, was starting to grow. They were getting bigger fans of their games. So this is really the first tournament that we see of the sport at the, Cal the California State Fair. So there was actually two different baseball games that were announced uh, that were going to be happening at the State Fair. The first 
uh, was at the Centerville, Centerville Race Course. It was going to be a baseball game of two teams following the 10-mile horse race. And the prize was given at $100 for the winning team. The second game that was announced was the actual um, game for the California State Fair. The first one was kind of just a warm-up. Uh, it was just going to be um, a fun game before the actual game. And they declared this game as the one that would decide who the champion, um, best baseball club in California was for that first year. And for the, the championship game, they were going to award the winning team a uh, silver ball valued at $50. The second team was going to get a $25 cup. Um, and most importantly, they were going to pick the best players from the game to create actually our first all-star um, team between the teams. So the only two teams that uh, joined this competition were the Sacramento Baseball Club and the San Francisco Baseball Club. So after a full year of games, we finally have the matchup we had been waiting for. Um, Sacramento versus San Francisco, and at this point, both teams were undefeated. Neither had lost a game, so this was going to be a really big uh, tournament at the California State Fair to see who actually was the better team. There was a lot of back and forth in the newspapers um, between them to kind of gloat and um, say that their team was better, but at the end of the day, um, that first game after the horse race, we have... Uh, the first three innings of the game, they had quite a bit of a late start, so they only got three innings in before the game was called due to darkness. At the end of three innings, San Francisco, which had been named, renamed the Eagle Club at that point, they were up 11-7. to seven. Um, Not a huge difference back then. There was high-scoring games. They came back the next day, um, and the Eagles held on to a very close game. It was 36-32. to 32. Um, you know, the, the scores were very high, and if you can imagine looking at other box scores, 36 to 32 is actually on the lower end of scoring. Um, if you look at some of the New York box scores, a lot of them, a lot of the runs in the early days go to the 70s, 80s, um, sometimes even over 100 runs in a game, which is um, crazy to think of now. Um, but that first, as I said, this was kind of a warm-up game, so it was really the following day, or actually the same day, because they finished the first game um, into that second game. So following this game, they started the the game that would decide who was the champion. So the Eagles, uh, a.k.a. the San Francisco Club, won that first game. And in the second game, it was a little bit more lopsided. It was 31-17. to The Eagles um, were declared the champion. They were given the silver ball. And I apologize, there's not too many pictures. Not that many pictures were taken back in the 1860s, as you can imagine. But um, this ball did survive. Um, that's the actual baseball that was given out to the winning team, uh, which was the Eagles, winning 31-17. to They only played six innings. Uh, again, due to darkness, they had to delay the start of this game because they were finishing the other game. But either way, this was more or less the end of the very first season in baseball. So we wrap up the end. San Francisco Eagles, they were declared the winner. So we have our very first champion of, of California baseball. But, as I mentioned before, the secondary purpose of this game was they were establishing who the best players in the state were. So, they had a committee uh, put together to select, based on those two games, who played the best. And, we'll see here, it's a pretty even split between the two teams. Um, we have Edward Kerrigan as the best pitcher, Nathan B. Kendall as their best catcher, uh, Wilcock as the best first baseman. John Fisher, who I mentioned before and we'll mention again, that's his photo there. Uh, he was the best second baseman. Samuel Wade, we do have a picture of him as well, best third baseman. John Keenan um, from Sacramento, he was the best shortstop. Uh, Brummett was left fielder, center fielder was Cosgrove, right fielder uh, was John Durkee again, who I mentioned and will mention again as the best right fielder. And um, they picked the best overall hitter uh, Nathan B. Kendall, who was also chosen as the best catcher. Now, what's baseball without a little more controversy? Um, there was only a few games in California history, and they were already riddled with plenty of controversy from that first game being tied and disputed. There was a lot of heated discussions uh, following many of the baseball games. And 
Another one was when they selected Nathan B. Kendall from the Sacramento team. Um, again, that was the losing team. They selected him as the best catcher as well as the best hitter. This really upset the San Francisco team. They thought their catcher, who was Marion Gelston, and he was a very prominent player in New York before coming to, before coming to San Francisco to play. Um, so he had all this experience playing. In New York, he he really he's he played on the Eagle team in New York, and that's why the San Francisco cha team changed their name to the Eagle Club. So he was a big deal when he came over. He really taught uh, more specific on how the game was supposed to be played. He was supposed to be the expert, and he was supposedly the best catcher. But um, for reasons unknown, um, they selected the Sacramento catcher Nathan B. Kendall, and they had a lot of uh, negative things to say in the press about that decision. The the committee that they had formed, they got um, a lot of angry uh, messages through the newspaper system, um, which seems crazy. But in order to kind of correct this, the Eagle team decided that they were going to create their own award. They actually uh, came together. They bought a uh, they bought a medal that they gave to their catcher, who they rightfully thought deserved that award. Um, it was a it was a gold medal that stated "Best Catcher in California," and they gave it to him, um, declaring that uh, he was the best catcher. So they were mostly contesting that it was the uh, catcher. There's actually it's um, funny to notice there was a lot of players. That if you look at the statistics, the box scores from the game, there was plenty of hitters that hit better than um, Nathan B. Kendall. So it's puzzling to think back why they made it, chose them. Um, but we do get only a small picture. The box scores from the early um, days of baseball they really only they only showcase two different stats. It was runs and it was outs. So it's hard to say what else they did in the game. So. We may never know. Um, there is, you know, a discrepancy between history and recorded history. So we only have what we, we know that was recorded from the newspapers. So here we have the final uh, standings. 1860, we wrapped up the first season of baseball. It was quite lively. We had a lot of teams that joined. Um, and these were the final standings. I know today, Major League Baseball, they play 160 games back in the early 1800s, um, it's important to note that none of these players were being paid. This was more of a casual recreation. Um, it was gentlemen that uh, more often than not, they worked together and they would do this in their free time, after work, on weekends. So they only played once or twice a month on average. So we see the standings that look a little bit smaller. Um, we see some of the high runs for, runs against. Uh, Eagle team finished on top and the Sacramento Baseball Club finished um, right there in second. So we had a lot of momentum going um, after the 1860 season um, to establish baseball, but unfortunately after the 1860 season the reports of baseball uh, seemed to just disappear completely from California newspapers and it's because of one thing that happened in the early 1860s. You guys could probably guess what that might be. <laughs> It was the Civil War um, from 1861 to 1865, and we virtually see no um, baseball being mentioned in the newspapers at all. Um, we can assume that baseball was probably still being played um, here and there, but more important things took precedent. So after a successful first season, we unfortunately see just a drop-off. So the only team that remained from that original season was the San Francisco team the Eagle Baseball Club. And in order to keep things going in the baseball world, they split off into two teams. So they created a sub-team, the Pacific Baseball Club of San Francisco. Um, they started playing themselves a little bit just in order to get baseball momentum um, back up and running. And two, the Eagle Baseball Club and the Pacific Baseball Club, um, into the 1870s, they really had um, a fierce rivalry. I don't get into it too much in this uh, presentation, but um, they became one of the biggest rivalries. Their games uh, gathered huge crowds, and um, oftentimes it was very um, uh, controversy-led with 
you know, teams accusing other teams of um, cheating and stuff like that, but it really created a lot of interest in the sport. And it's important to note, too, uh, the Civil War brought a lot of interest in baseball. It was really, at the time, centered just in New York and the East Coast, but mostly New York. When the Civil War started, uh, they were playing baseball on the battlefields, they were spreading the game, and this is, to many historians, they um, attribute the Civil War to the explosion of baseball uh, throughout the country. So this is just a picture here of the Pacific Baseball Club. Uh, that's the team that was the offspin of the Eagle Baseball Club. This is actually the earliest picture of a baseball team in California that's known. Uh, this was, picture was taken in 1866, so a little bit later down the line. Uh, still need, they're actually holding the championship bat. Um, it's, it's difficult to see in the picture, but the championship bat was given to the team that finished uh, best each year. So instead of like the World Series trophy or a final championship, they didn't really have a game that established who was the winner, and they didn't really go based on final statistics. Um, the way they did it is the team that held the championship bat, any team could challenge them. If they beat them, they got the bat. So it was a little bit different than we know it today. Um, so any team could challenge them. They were required to uh, accept a challenge at least once a month. So the Pacific Baseball Club actually overtook the team that they came from, the San Francisco baseball team, and they became more of the premier team. They won a handful of times. They held on to that championship bat quite a bit. Um, again, that wasn't without controversy. The San Francisco team actually got suspended for a year for um, a bunch of shenanigans of them accusing them of cheating and then bending the rules themselves. But um, I do want to really highlight two specific people that I think have been completely lost in history. There's only a few casual mentions of them in history books. Um, but I kind of mentioned it before. It's John Leonard Durkee as well as John uh, Fisher, who really are responsible for the early days of baseball and uh, really responsible for keeping the game going. So we'll start with John Durkee. He was born in Baltimore. He was part of that gold rush group that came over um, in search of gold in 1849. He was a prominent firefighter. He established the first volunteer fire company in San Francisco when he moved there. Uh, one year later, he switched over to the police department. And I just kind of threw in there that he was part of the, the um, Committee of Vigilance. He, well, when the police department was still first started in San Francisco, uh, it, was, it was a mess for them trying to get started. So many people that were part of that original police department, uh, because of fraud and um, some other issues, they actually decided to take matters into their own hands, and he became a really um, influential figure in um, vigilante justice, um, and he almost went to prison a couple times for some of the things that he did, um, but a few years later he came back to join the police department after things had settled quite a bit. Um, so he had quite a busy life before he actually got around to establishing that first baseball club, but he was one of the original founders of that San Francisco Eagle Baseball Club. <coughs> he was named the top right fielder in that game at the California State Fair. Um, so not only did he start the team, he was actually a good player himself. Uh, and one of the most important things that he did was help establish the Pacific Baseball Convention. Um, if you remember, the National Association of Baseball Players was that group of uh, 16 teams from New York and Brooklyn that established uh, that committee or that um, association to standardize rules and make everything kind of a, a fair, even playing field. So, the Pacific Baseball Convention was California's version of that. Uh, there wasn't really a great way, still at the time, to get from the East Coast to California. The Transcontinental Railroad was a few years off from this, so they were separate. They did not. Uh, join the National Association of Baseball Players out in New York, even though it was open to anyone. But they did decide to use all of their same rules. So they were heavily influenced by that. And creating the Pacific Baseball Convention really was the rebirth of baseball. We saw that, that 1860 year uh, with the teams coming on board and that momentum before the Civil War hit. 
it was this that reestablished it, and he was right at the forefront of that. Uh, he did in 1897. Uh, he died at the age of 70. Uh, but his good friend Matthew Fisher, he was actually a pallbearer at uh, at Jerky's funeral. Um, we don't know too much about Matthew or John Fisher. We know quite a bit more about John Durkee. He was very prevalent in the community. He was a uh, still very involved in the fire department. He was huge into the original police department of San Francisco. So there's a lot of information on him. Uh, John Fisher, on the other hand, he was a metalsmith, and the newspapers weren't quite reporting much on metalsmiths. So we have very little information on him, but we do know he was born in Australia, and he eventually made his way over to San Francisco and established the Eagle Baseball Club of San Francisco with John Durkee. He was named that top second baseman in that California State Fair, and he was actually elected the first president of the Pacific Baseball Convention. And he died of heart disease in 1909 at the age of 80. And this is just kind of a quick snapshot uh, of the Pacific Baseball Convention. Um, this is their first guide. They list out all their rules, their, their protocols. And this lasted from 1866 to 1877. And in this time, we see an explosion of baseball in California, which was exciting to see, um, especially coming back from that, from that lull of five years or so that we didn't have any baseball. We had teams up and down the coast of California that joined the convention. This really set the precedent for uh, having standardized play, same rules, and it listed all that. So after the Pacific Baseball Convention, this turned into the very first baseball league that we have which is the Pacific League, started one year later in 1878, so it kind of switched over, and we see our very first league. Uh, before, the conventions really just had, it was just a group of teams that decided when they were going to play each other. The first league was estab an established schedule, so they knew at the beginning of the season kind of who they were going to play, and they established schedules with standings and championships as we know it today. So that's more or less the end of my presentation on how baseball started in California and the people that were really responsible for bringing it to California and keeping it here. So I did want to talk about a little bit the Deer Brothers. Um, that's the team I mentioned at the beginning. That's uh, the team I play for. Um, so we play with 1886 rules. It was a little bit of a stretch. Uh, we were establishing the team in Temecula. There's not a lot of baseball history here from the 1800s, but uh, Parker Deer, who some of you may know, um, he lived at, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys know a lot more um, speculative history, but he lived on Santa Rosa Plateau area, um, and him, along with uh, four other brothers, uh, established the Deer Brothers baseball team, which they didn't actually play in Temecula, they played mostly in Pasadena um, after they had moved out that way after living here in the Temecula Valley. Um, but we decided we wanted to honor the history of Temecula, so we chose the Deer Brothers as our team name. And that's how we play today. And if you guys are interested in seeing the old school of baseball play out in person, we actually play eight games a year. Our first game is coming up in just a few weeks. Um, on uh, May 14th, we're going to be playing in Paris. The league features seven different teams up and down. Um, Southern California area. We do have four home games that we're tentatively scheduled to play at Temecula Valley High School. And I know some uh, members, you guys were out at our season last year. It's always a, a fun time. It's free to free to attend. You get to see how the game actually was played uh, back in 1886. So it's a lot of fun. If you guys are able to make it to one of these games, we'd love to have you out. Um, we often have fans at different games that are dressed in 1880s attire. So it's definitely neat. And if you guys are interested um, in learning more information about our team and whatnot, you can ask us. We have players here um, in uniform. They're pretty identifiable, so you can ask them if you have any questions, and uh, me as well. Um, there is a website for the Southern California Vintage Baseball League um, that has more information, more schedules, and all that good stuff. Um, but that pretty much wraps up my presentation. I thank you guys for listening, and hopefully you enjoyed the... Oh, yeah, my question. that you do then as opposed to now. 
Yeah, so uh, by the time we get to 1886, which is the rule book we use, uh, we got a lot closer to baseball as we know it today, but some of the main differences come in the form of pitching. By 1886, um, they were allowing overhand pitching, but there was a lot of restrictions on um, when you pitch your leg can't come above your belt, so you can't get as much uh, momentum on it. So they were still trying to limit how fast players were throwing into the catcher um, so players could still you know, hit the ball. Another major difference is uh, a walk with seven balls back then. So at bats were much longer. It took seven bad pitches in order to walk. And if you got hit by a pitch, today if you get hit by a pitch, you take your base at first. Back then, 1886 rules, you get hit by a pitch, that's just a ball. <laughs> so, and it takes seven of those in order to walk. So, that was probably um, the main difference. Um, foul balls, that's another big one. Foul balls do not count as a strike in 1886. So, with you know, foul balls not counting as a strike and seven balls in order to walk, the at-bats were quite a bit lengthier. So, those are some of the main differences. The equipment is also uh, the main difference. We play in these very thick uniforms, and our games, as you can see, are in the middle of summer. So uh, we try to keep our games nice and early, uh, but it still gets hot. Um, we use authentic gloves. The bats are also different. They are a lot heavier than they are today. So I, I believe they're 40 ounces, 40 ounce uh, bat, which is a lot heavier than players use today. So it's like swinging a big... Uh, tree log in order to hit that ball. Um, the ball was a little bit different as well. It was uh, almost the same as it was today, but just a little bit softer. But not much. It still hurts. When were the players first uh, starting to get paid? So the first professional team in baseball history was 1869. That was the Cincinnati Red Stockings. Uh, the first, it's kind of a fuzzy area for California, but the first uh, team to get paid in California, I believe it was uh, 1878 is when players started to get paid. But um, 1869, when the Cincinnati Red Stockings started getting paid, it really kind of spiraled into uh, baseball switched over from being uh, a sport that you played casually to a business. And that's when things really started to take off on that side. And Major League Baseball came into play. and more or less turned it into a money-making business as opposed to uh, a leisurely game. Yeah, I don't know what they called it, but you know, those early versions of baseball, and it wasn't a diamond, it was a square, so the home, home plate, and actually a fun fact, home plate is, you kind of, if you know the shape today, it's, you know, a, yeah. Um, that actually didn't start until the 1900s. A lot of times back in the day, it was actually just, it was a circle. Um, or it was a circle or a square. So we actually didn't get the shape of home plate until much later. Um, but in the early versions, when they did have the five bases, they had home plate and then they had four bases. So first base would be directly to the batter's right, and third or fourth base would be directly to the batter's left. So they would be a lot closer to home. Um, the real play came in between uh, first and second, second and third, third and fourth. And the game was played a little bit differently then, but... Um, but if you took four bases, then we have a single, a double, and a triple. Yeah, so it, it, was, it was definitely different back then. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what they called it. There's not a lot of, too much recorded history on, on that kind of stuff. But yeah, it's definitely interesting. Um, they also didn't have to stay within the baseline, so there's a lot of reports of um, the real uh, real players could really uh, avoid tagging by going all over the field. So um, it was different, but um, two, you were able to throw the ball at the player so back in that day. So it, it was definitely a, a much different sport than we see it today. Yes. Sure. Oh, yes, thank you. That, that's another major difference. So I know I talked about the strike zone a little bit. Um, the strike zone didn't really come into play until after the 1860s. Um, but by the time we get to 1886, which is the rules we play with for the Temecula Deer Brothers, uh, the batter was able to choose their strike zone so that you could choose low zone or high zone. So the, the low zone would be uh, the knees to the belt, and the high zone would be the belt to the shoulders. So it put a little more control in the batter's hands. They could choose where they wanted to, to see the baseball pitched. 
Um, so yeah, thank you. That was another that's another big difference. And that actually disappeared a couple of years later. So that was only there for a few years after that. And then they standardized the the knees. Uh, back then, it was like knees to the letters. Yes. There was a name of uh, one of the players that came out during the gold rush. It was Ebbets. Yeah, Any relation to Ebbets Field? Ebbets I had the Field. same question. So yeah. I was really hoping that he did have a relation to Ebbets Field, but completely separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no relation at all. I, I dug into that for a couple days trying to find out. Uh, but yeah, no relation. All right. What's the schedule? I don't see your home games for So the for? games that say verse. Um, those are our home games. The ones that have the at symbol, those are our away games. So our first home game is going to be on uh, oh, okay. Okay. May 28th. Uh, that's for yep. Lordsburg. Um, yeah, so we have four home games and four away games. The ones with the at symbols, those are when we're on the road. What time? So we don't have any time set quite yet. We typically start our home games. We like to start them early because of these thick jerseys. Um, so we usually shoot for about 10 o'clock. Uh, but we'll have that posted on the website once we get more confirmation. Yeah, I mean, as a, um, a baseball historian in general, um, I kind of dug deep into the history of a lot of different um, sports. And another one that I'm very passionate about is the um, women in baseball. Um, if anybody's seen the movie A League of Their Own, oh, yeah. uh, that's my favorite movie of all time. Um, I've watched it dozens and dozens of times, but it really led me to get deep into the history of that league as well, which that has a really fascinating story. If you guys haven't uh, looked into it, uh, A League of Their Own is a portrayal of that league, um, but it was a very real league. It started you know, World War II when most all the players um, were off to war, and uh, Mr. Wrigley uh, needed something to get, um, uh, he needed to still make money, so he kind of brought on this league and had girls play. It's a really fascinating story. Maybe there could be another uh, presentation for another time, but um, yeah. Do you so, still do publish uh, I, I don't too much anymore. Yeah. I just follow them. What's your website? So the website for the Vintage Baseball League is SoCal. VBB, so SoCal Vintage Baseball, so SoCalVBB.com. What is uh, Cooperstown think of the myth? So, uh, that's, Cooperstown has embraced both sides of the history. They've embraced the story of Abner Doubleday as it's an important story in baseball history. Um, I mean, they built the Hall of Fame there, so it has a lot of historical significance. Even though it was a myth, it's a very historical uh, myth to the game, so they embrace both sides of the history. They they really embrace the true story now. Um, if you ever had a chance to go there, um, they really embrace all the things I talked about as far as the New York game goes. And then they have a whole um, dedication to the double day myth, and they really go into that. So they embrace both sides of it. So your team, the Deer Brothers uh, team, actually is based on a real team that Parker Deer from the Santa Rosa Plateau had. Yes, so Parker Deer started the team um, with his brothers. Um, he didn't play in Temecula. The team didn't really play here. I, I don't know the exact date. I know um, Parker Deer moved, I don't know if he moved to Pasadena or out that direction, but that's where his team played. So um, I think I had, oh yeah, so this is actually a picture of the actual Deer Brothers team from, um, and I know we play with the 1886 rules, but he didn't really play until the early 1900s. Um, but it's the closest connection we could find. Um, but yeah, that's an actual team that we modeled our team after. Will I be wearing Will I be wearing, yeah, so for those of you that don't know, I'm actually doing the same presentation in Cooperstown uh, this upcoming Saturday. I'm at the Hall of Fame for part of the uh, Society of American Baseball Research, their 19th century uh, uh, conference. So I'll be doing this again. So this was a great opportunity to kind of do a first uh, run through with you guys. It, oh yeah, I didn't even answer the question. I'm thinking about it. Yeah, I might. I might. Although my presentation focuses mostly on the 1860s, so this is a little after, but um, I will be bringing it for sure.
Yeah. Oh, Parker Deer was the junior. This son. Oh yeah, Parker. Parker Deer Jr. and the other siblings were the. Yeah. Parker Deer. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.